Okay, then let me introduce the people who actually know what they're talking about here. Um, <coughs> starting from the end, um, Leslie Carruthers, uh, presently scholar in residence at Pace Law School. Um, most of us know her from her long tenure as president of the uh, Environmental Law Institute, uh, going back over a decade. Decade, right? Um, but as Henry remarked in our little story off in the back, um, she, she is a public-private partnership in her own right. <laughs> Um, she uh, had parts of her career with United Technologies Corporation, big, serious, high-grade manufacturing group. Uh, part of her career as the commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection. Um, she was at EPA where she uh, both officially held the position of and was known as the enforcer. You may ask her questions on this if you wish. Um, now chairs the, uh, has chaired the board <coughs> of the Connecticut Audubon Society, uh, sits on all sorts of things. and. Uh, has been my colleague in any number of, of usually agreeable uh, committee report operations. Uh, and what I've asked Leslie to do is give us, <coughs> from her you know, almost uniquely broad perspective, some perspective for ourselves on where these issues come from. Uh, following up will be um, Neil Hawkins. Um, Neil is currently Vice President of Sustainability, Environment, Health, and Safety for Dow Chemical. Um, he, in this role, does all sorts of things which I will ask him to describe, um, but has uh, received uh, numerous awards for his creativity in this area. Uh, I, I think I first got to know him um, along with, when we, both, when we both served along with Leslie on the National Academy's Roundtable on Science and Technology for Sustainability, where I found him to be an always challenging <coughs> but basically agreeable guy to work with, uh, from whom I learned a lot. Um, uh, but his really important credentials is he holds uh, doctorates and master's degrees from Harvard. Okay, so, right guy. Uh, finally, um, uh, Glenn Prickett, who unfortunately my last line will not be, and he fits, he's a Yaley, but I'm a Yaley too, so it's okay. Um, he is currently uh, Chief External Affairs Officer at the Nature Conservancy, um, and I've asked him to describe TNC's work um, a bit. Uh, he came to the Conservancy from a long career at Conservation International, which uh, many of you will know is one of the most active uh, and creative original conservation organizations working um, around the world. Uh, he's been with the Clinton administration as <coughs> the Chief Environmental Advisor for uh, USAID, um, was before that with uh, NRDC and so forth. And I've asked each of them to say a little bit about uh, their either current or recent past uh, organizations as it pertains to the venture here as they come up. So for introductory comments, I'll start with Leslie, go around the group, and then we'll start the question discussion. Okay, thank you, Bill. Um, I wanna thank the Roy family for conceiving and implementing this, I think, very wonderful award, very imaginative and, and different in its focus. Uh, and also to thank the Kennedy School and, and Henry and Bill for inviting me today to participate in this. I know Neil and Glenn from long associations and have the utmost respect for, for both of these professional colleagues. Um, I was told that I had three to five minutes to provide the history of environmental partnerships in the free world <coughs> and, uh, and also to talk about the reasons for collaborating on a topic like ecosystem services, which is a rather uh, daunting charge, but uh, let me just take a deep breath and uh, jump in. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to start with a few simple definitions, then add a few descriptions from my perspective of what government, industry, and environmental, non-governmental organizations bring to the table in terms of partnerships and then offer a few examples of some successful ventures. There are, of course, thousands and thousands, and it was hard to pick a couple, but I will comment on a few. <clears throat> and then I will talk about why getting much better at ecosystem service evaluation, evaluation is more important than ever today. Um, environmental partnerships are new. I'm going to talk about the proposal in the example section, but they were given a bit of a boost in 2002 at the World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg, a meeting I attended while taking a year off between United Technologies and ELI. Um, <clears throat> the UN came up with a rather elaborate series of principles for formal partnerships, but I'm not going to talk about those. Part of the background of the meeting, and I want to dismiss that as well, 
was the notion that partnerships were really a plot by the Bush administration <coughs> to sort of fob off government responsibilities and costs onto the <coughs> private sector. And who knows, there may have been some of that motivation, but that's not really what animates the partnerships that were conceived either at that meeting or, or before or since. Um, uh, basically, the, the simplest definition is simply that partnerships for the environment, as well as other social purposes, occur when actors from different sectors voluntarily come together to produce something that they can produce together that they can't produce by themselves. I sort of like the definition given by Paul Anastas, the Yale Green Chemistry guru and head of the Office of Research and Development during the, Obama's first term, a couple years of that, he said partnerships arise through situations where there is recognition of mutual benefits of working together by those in power to assign resources and rewards. I'm sitting here with two guys who are, have been in power to do, uh, to do just that. I do think, and based on experience, and I don't think it will surprise you, it's sort of common sense, but that the major sectors bring different strengths as well as resources and, and maybe rewards to, those, to the partnerships. Government obviously has the legal authority to make things happen. It has financial support in many cases, and it has relative stability of commitment. I have to say that right now, when Republicans in the House of Representatives are revolting, really revolting, uh, <laughs> it's a little hard to talk about sustaining commitments, but this too shall pass. Um, however, the government has certain disadvantages. It can't usually move very quickly, and it has regulatory responsibilities and sometimes contract relationships that can complicate relationships with industry or NGO partners, informing them and in getting things done. Turning to business and industry, most companies have reasonably clear goals to produce goods and services, uh, to make money by doing it well and by meeting customer expectations, and I think to be regarded as solid corporate citizens in their communities. This latter comment sort of reflects my bias that, and my experience in working with some of the, the best, best people in, in corporate America. Um, I think that in areas like environmental partnership, business concern for reputation is just about as important as their concern for financial returns and motivating their commitments. And that's a, a conversation I want to engage with, uh, with Neil and when, uh, when, when we get to that part of the discussion. Compared to government, at least, business can be nimble. They can think up and try new things more easily and they can cut their losses more quickly if things don't work out. So uh, they bring special talents as well as, as resources and a, a pretty, pretty strong stability um, to a partnership. Civil society and NGOs, it's very hard to generalize about this category because they're so diverse, small, large, focused on very different things, but all NGOs have goals to, that we're talking about, have goals to advance protection of the environment, even if they focus on one part of it. They have constituencies who share those goals, and in the case of the big ones, and sometimes not so big ones, they are able to raise money from funders and members to uh, advance the achievement of those goals. I particularly think that that <clears throat> non-governmental organizations have the opportunity and I think usually the record of bringing imagination and creativity and new ideas to the party. And often, uh, not always, but often a greater ability to get things done with local people on the ground, which is really a critical in terms of solving some of the problems that we have. It's hard work to do that. You have to know what you're doing. And I think many of them do, and that's, that's part of what they bring to partnerships. Some examples. My favorite one, which you may know, <coughs> one of my favorite ones, is the Health Effects Institute. I don't know whether you know it. They're just down in Charlestown. They're 33 years old. They are an independent health science research organization focused on air pollution. They do absolutely bulletproof original research and validation of other people's work. And for 33 years, they've been funded by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency and a whole bunch of the auto companies. 
hands off. They may be told what the agenda is, but they don't control it. The work is independent, and they've had an extraordinary impact in just ending the debate about things like the impact of particulate pollution on cardiovascular uh, uh, effects, and they're, they just have done really excellent work in this area, and they do so uh, as a partnership and a funding partnership of a major industry and, and the Environmental Protection Agency. Their first board chair was Archibald Cox, as some of you might know. He was one of Harvard's heroes, certainly one of our law school's heroes. So that's one. Um, another type is is organizations that join companies and localities kind of act as clearinghouses to set them up to do good projects on the ground. Uh, energy projects, water projects, there's an organization that I can't vouch for except I thought they sounded interesting called REAP, Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Partnership, which started at, in 2002, has 250 partners. They have funding from European governments, and they try to get companies to go and work with local communities to develop and execute on energy projects. Uh, there is a thing called the Clean Water Challenge. I think Dow may be involved in that, <coughs> which is not quite as big as REAP, but it's another consortium of funders and companies uh, that try to work with localities that need help in both planning and executing water and sanitation projects. And some very good work has been done by them as well. The last one I want to mention is, a, is more complicated and a little harder to explain, so I, I'm going to have to talk even faster. Um, and that's product uh -huh. certification partnerships. I'm sure as many of you know, there's a lot of activity and has been for some time in terms of uh, non-governmental organizations working with producers of various commodities like wood or coffee or, or fish uh, to uh, introduce them and try to train them to use sustainable and, and environmentally friendly processes in producing them. The, it, it's mostly NGOs who have initiated this, like the World Resources Institute, the, rain field, uh, the uh, Rainforest, um, initiative and um, what they what they have done in terms of partnerships besides partnering with the producers is they have gotten many businesses to agree to buy uh, uh, those materials from from either those producers directly or from suppliers who deal with them and to use their supply chain leverage to uh, expand the, uh, the number of producers who follow uh, advanced uh, production processes. Um, there, it's an interesting question, the motivations for these. Uh, there's been a lot of work done on this, by, particularly by the Packard Foundation, which has been interested in this area. Um, about what the motivations are to do this, um, whether businesses really think they're going to make money because, frankly, there's not much evidence that people will pay more in terms of a price premium for certified projects, or whether they see the value in terms of getting a supply chain that's more responsible and competent and stable, and, and that's a good thing. Clearly, these partnerships have benefits. They raise the standards for production, they're much more flexible than government regulation because they can adapt to the locality and they can be much more uh, easy to change and to upgrade. But um, one of the issues is the, whether the business case is really pricing or money or whether it's reputation or whether it's uh, uh, dependability of the supply chain. I think it's still a kind of open question uh, uh, whether this is a business or a philanthropic or a mix, and I think lots of things are. Uh, okay, let me turn really, uh, really quickly to oh, um, ecosystem services. Um, there's been a, a long-standing goal to try to do a better job of defining the economic uh, value of these benefits. Um, I think I want to tip my hat a little bit in my my perspective on this is that the World Business Council on Sustainable Development and the World Resources Institute have, have done a lot of pioneering work on this, uh, 
uh, in this area, partly because they're interested in measurement and because the business community has been sort of, sort of totally intently focused on how we can monetize more of these resources so that they can more readily integrate them into their financial planning and, and, and activities. Uh, but it's kind of ebbed and flowed, and I think this project is exciting because, partly because of the way they've, they've done it and the way they've made it, uh, are able to demonstrate uh, the actual effectiveness of, the, of their technique uh, on particular sites. Um, I think it's not just business, though, that has an interest in being able to do this well. Uh, the government has a huge stake in, in valuation, too. EPA has historically been more focused on the health agenda. I don't think that's a bad thing. I I'm not, don't say that as a criticism. Most of their scientists are focused on health. And the whole area of really developing a strong capability to do ecosystem service evaluation and valuation, uh, not just in terms of money, but in terms of other amenities, uh, has been, I think, neglected. Getting ready for this, this, this kind of trying to refresh my recollection on some of this, as we lawyers say, um, I happened to read a, uh, a report by the Science Advisory Board from 2009 about what EPA should do to increase its efforts. It's an excellent report. It's one of the best reports of that kind I think I've ever seen. And I don't know how far they took them seven years to do it. <laughs> it should have been good. But um, the fact is, it has a lot of recommendations for how they can improve their own capability to do this. Why should they do it? Well, for one thing, it's very hard to get regulations through the Office of Management and Budget in any administration uh, unless you can pass their cost-benefit uh, hurdles. Uh, I think they're excessive, but you know, the, the, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, I'm not being partisan here, the, the pressure has been to monetize just practically everything, and this area has suffered. Um, so uh, I think that there are gonna be lessons for, does that mean I'm cut off? Um, only by a higher authority than okay. mine. Okay, oh, all right. I, I, I thought maybe that was the red light. But, but I'm maybe almost, someone. I thought that was the red light. I'm almost done. I'm, I'm, I'm almost done here. Um, but anyway, uh, so I, I'm excited by the fact that I think that the work that is being done by these folks and others um, is going to feed into government and enable them to help really get their act together in, in you know, joining a, le a leadership group that can really, really make progress in this area. Why do we need it? I mean, I think the need is greater than ever. I mean, what is sustainability about? Is it about health? Sure. But it's, but it's first and foremost about the entire resource base on which those of us who are Greens believe our economy and our society depends. If we're serious about a sustainability agenda, we have to get a better handle on ecological resources, their value, and what we need to do to protect them. Secondly, there's a whole issue of green infrastructure. I, I think you, w w Neil's presentation will deal with that a little bit. It's finally gotten some traction, the idea that we can use landscaping and trees and, and permeable surfaces and stuff to deal th with things like storm runoff in cities. That hasn't been that hasn't been moved ahead until recently, I think, because there hasn't been enough rigor in the analysis, again, which this kind of, kind of work can provide. Plus, enforcement types like me and many environmental groups didn't believe that the cities would follow through. And they're still a little concerned about this, but, but much less. And lastly, of course, there's climate change. Oh, by the way, yes. <laughs> and the fact is, uh, the whole, the whole ball game has to do with disruption and damage to the basic ecological systems of our planet. And if we don't understand those better in every dimension, and if we don't develop the capability to explain those better and why it is important that we mitigate greenhouse gases and that we adopt adaptation, adaptation strategies, then we're toast. And so I think this is, this is just extremely timely in terms of at least three of the major priorities, not only for the government, not only for business and the NGOs, but for the community at large. Thank you. Sorry, I went over. I know I did. <laughs> but, but we like you anyway. Um, so from that 30,000-foot vision of the, the, the world of 
innovative policy and organizational arrangements within which uh, this particular partnership evolved. Um, let me turn to Neil and Glenn, who tell me they're going to do a tag team match of taking this down to a specific case that need not be the only focus of our discussion, but it would be foolish of us not to uh, pluck this particular piece of experience for all we can draw from it in illuminating how people have grappled with some of the tensions and opportunities that Leslie described. So I think Neil is going to start. Yep. Uh, okay. Thank you very much, uh, Bill and, and also Henry, for having us, the Roy family. Thank you very much for putting together this remarkable award. And I think what you'll hear us talk about tonight um, is actually a leverageable uh, concept and learning that can move forward uh, to other companies and other other partnerships. So we'll, we're going to try to give you a good overview of that. And Leslie, uh, thank you for that very interesting uh, summation. And I look forward to your remarks during Q&A. Um, I've been at Dow 25 years. So at the time I left Harvard, uh, the Harvard School of Public Health, I joined the Dow Chemical Company. And this was during a time, uh, Leslie already mentioned, uh, the, the uh, Rio Summit and then Jay Berg. But if you go back into that period, 87, 88, we had just had the definition of sustainable development from the UN. This was a very rich time. And, and Dow at that time had a leader of environment, health, and safety, David Bazzelli, who was very visionary about trying to get ahead of these issues and, and really make it work within a company. Um, and I think to a great extent, this partnership represents the best in our transformation and how we're trying to work um, to become a, an ever more uh, good partner uh, with communities and uh, society on the whole. Um, one thing Leslie talked about was philanthropy versus um, economics. And let me just say right up front, this is an economics-based project. It would have been far easier, and we wouldn't be here tonight, if we had just said, hey, Glenn, TNC, we'd like to do a $10 million series of land acquisitions. TNC knows how to do that. There's you can time. Yeah, no, that's okay. <laughs> okay. Let that go. <laughs> but that is really a key, key point because this project is built around how do you make economics of ecosystems work hand in glove with business decision making. And that's no small thing. That's actually a very big thing. We're accustomed to achieving that through public policy um, and other instruments. So, and largely in this area, that's not available right now. We'll talk more about that during uh, Q&A. But as, as I make remarks and Glenn, I just want you to differentiate that because it's very different than what you would expect <coughs> Dow and TNC to be doing. Is this working? This, this quote from Pavan Sukhdev, I, I think, is one of the most important ones out there. We use nature because it is valuable, but we lose nature because it is free. And Pavan um, was on special assignment uh, to the United Nations, and he headed up the TEAB report, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. But he came to that role out of Deutsche Bank. He was from, from the private sector. And so he brought a whole new way of looking at this it, that really, I think, is at the core of what we're trying to achieve in the partnership. But that one quote, to me, is a very important one, and we think about it frequently. But what we had uh, in terms of the genesis of this project if you look at where Dow is, we've actually had two sets of 10-year sustainability goals. The first one started in 95, the second one in 2005. And my CEO asked me several years ago, Neil, what is it that we're not working on in our sustainability goals 
that we really shouldn't wait five years to begin tackling. And our team internally debated it, and it was very obvious the one area related to ecosystems, biodiversity, and uh, related issues. So if, if you go up one level, nature writ large, but how does a company interface to nature? How does a company derive value from nature? How does a company provide value to communities because of their land holdings? And you might think of Dow as a manufacturing company, and we are, but we're global and we have land holdings all over the world. And so how we manage that land, and often materials companies, chemical companies are near water. So how we manage that land for our own value creation, but also for community value is very important. Here is a, a photograph of, I think yeah, I'm on the right slide. Here's a photograph of our CEO and Mark Tursek, who's CEO of the Nature Conservancy, at the Detroit Economic Club announcing this partnership. And you might think, why Detroit Economic Club? It was a very thoughtful choice. I mean, we could have come to New York. We could have gone to Washington. We could have come to the K School. But the reason is we wanted to make very clear this is about how do you value nature and actually build business decisions within a company around the value of nature. Um, so it was a bold move. I think it for both parties, for both organizations, for both of these leaders to say we're going to give this a whirl and, and try it. So how did Dow and the Nature Conservancy get together? Uh, we had worked together in a number of different projects, mainly conservation type projects, which is the bread and butter of TNC. But because Dow is local, you know, we're all over uh, with land holdings, we had had a history of doing conservation arrangements. Um, but really this was built around a new thought <clears throat> which Glenn will get into, I'm sure, when he makes his introductory remarks, that business, if you set up the economics right, has a key role in making good decisions, whether or not you have the public policy uh, there, whether or not it's, it's in the value chains, how can you actually increase the understanding of, of the value, the economic value, um, and enable those kinds of decisions. So we had this common belief that this could be done, or at least we were willing to try together. Um, TNC has some of the sharpest scientists and economists um, in the NGO world. They're very large, they're also global. We had worked together, and very importantly, as we negotiated this, both parties we're completely committed to transparency, publishing, and have a stated goal that we will leverage this to other companies. So the, the thought process behind it was, yes, it's good for Dow, we'll be an early mover, we'll derive value faster, but it wasn't a proprietary type thing. This was to be leveraged out as a concept. Um, so why would Dow care about this? And I, I've sort of alluded to this, but you have to think about uh, the land holdings of a large global uh, materials company like Dow. And we rely on water, so we use water primarily for cooling, but you've got to have it where you have plants. Um, and, but we rely also on other ecosystems um, for value, and we'll discuss what we learned at Freeport during Glenn's portion. Many of our products flow into applications that um, really get at some of the emerging needs that are arising out of this ecosystem, really, crisis. When you look at ecosystem destruction in the world and the ever-growing population of people that have to be fed, 
This requires a lot of innovation and ingenuity on how to feed the world, give the food, the, give the people the water they need, yet not destroy land that is needed for biodiversity. Um, we did have a lot of buy-in before we started this and commitment to provide sites to work on. This issue of green infrastructure, uh, I'm going to give you an example here in a minute, but it's a very key concept to uh, what we've been working on for the last several years and it's actually the most direct way to show value to a company, I think, in the short term because there are some real examples here that make a lot of sense. I'll mention one here in a minute. Remediation, we have a lot of properties that uh, over the years have been acquired through uh, acquisitions, et cetera, but we're doing a lot of work on bioremediation, so we're, we're looking at trees and other things, so it's a very logical extension to think about restoration that also is helpful to providing ecosystem value. Um, we have our ongoing conservation activities and land that provides a lot of ecosystem service value to others or to Dow also could be part of marketplaces like land banks where people developing land nearby need credits for uh, their activities. This is an area that has only really begun and the more you can create markets uh, for land or for other ecosystem services related to that land, the more this will naturally occur. On the, uh, on the one example, you know, because people ask all the time, they say, what well, really, you know, is there value here? Or is this just a PR kind of thing? Um, after we announced this project with TNC, we really scoured internally to understand all our conservation activities. What we were giving, what we were holding, how much land we held, which actually is not a simple question. It, it was rather complex. But in doing that internal investigation, so we understood ourselves better, we came across the Sea Drift, Texas example, which is a green infrastructure uh, example. And you might say, well, what is that? Well, more than 10 years ago, an engineer in Dow um, went in and he looked at this and said, you know, instead of building a gray infrastructure, i.e. a concrete-based extension to this wastewater treatment plant, what if we explored restoring a wetland and making it part of the system? Well, at that time, that was very novel. This was not being done much. And by the way, it's still not being done that much by private sector. But this person, uh, just on that one decision, saved, he spent $2 million restoring wetland, but he didn't spend $42 million on that wastewater treatment plant. So he was able to save in capital $40 million right there in capital. But then when you also include the operating costs that you didn't have to accumulate, it's more than $100 million on this one project. And the affluents are perfect. They're, they're in, they're monitored, and the wetland is providing the functionality, providing the value uh, that's needed in terms of, in this case, settling and filtration. And then for nature, what do you get? You get a, a wonderful land property that is full of local uh, biodiversity that you wouldn't have had otherwise. So I wanted to throw that one in. Uh, we, we actually have that paper in, in press that has been submitted for publication. Because with that kind of example, people can see the value inside a company or to other companies and I think you can create more and, and there aren't that many examples exactly like this so I don't want <coughs> you thinking there are hundreds of these things because there aren't but 
conceptually, it, it's a good teaching opportunity because people get it. And engineers that do this kind of work versus the, you know, the normal water treatment plant, they're taking a lot of risk. The regulators are not accustomed to this. They have to take risk. So we're trying to uh, improve the understanding and create a safe environment for people to explore these kinds of opportunities. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Glenn for the rest of the presentation. Great. Thank you, Neil. Um, let me also thank the Roy family and the Belfer Center here at the Kennedy School for giving us this award. Um, all of us at the Nature Conservancy are, are very honored to receive it. Um, it's kind of a uh, special, meaningful uh, privilege for me. Um, uh, John Kennedy spoke at a Yale commencement once, and he said, now I have the best of both worlds, a Harvard education and a Yale degree. Um, I don't think I'll ever merit a Harvard degree, but at least I get to go home with a Harvard award, so I'm very happy about that, and thank you. Um, so this, um, this is a very important project for the Nature Conservancy. Let me just, um, if I can make this work, say a few words about why. Um, so uh, we are um, the world's largest conservation organization. We have a very simple but very hard uh, mission, and that's to protect the lands and waters on which life depends. We've been at it for over 60 years. Um, we're pretty proud of what we've done. If you take all the land and water we've helped protect around the world and you put it all together, it would form an area larger than the state of California. So we, uh, we haven't been um, lazy, um, but... Um, <laughs> To be honest, uh, when our board and our leadership team a few years ago looked ahead um, at um, how we're going to achieve the mission, the, the future looks harder than the past. Um, so we needed to think differently about how we do it. Um, I hope you all know the Nature Conservancy. I hope you visited a preserve. If you haven't, I hope you will. Uh, we have our team from uh, our Massachusetts chapter here today uh, who can introduce you. Um, but as Neil said, this project is different from uh, a, a traditional Nature Conservancy project. Um, and when we think about how do we need to work in the future to achieve our mission, we really uh, need to think about um, what nature provides people. Um, as the world goes from seven to nine billion people, as living standards rise, and importantly, as people are less connected with nature, we can't expect everybody to come to this in the same way that Nature Conservancy supporters of the past have come to it, um, believing in the protection of nature for its own sake. Um, so essentially, we and many others spent the 20th century protecting nature from people, um, through the reserves and the bans and the requirements um, that Bill mentioned. Um, now we know we need to spend the 21st century protecting nature for people, and that's how we get to this idea of ecosystem services, or as we call it, the value of nature. Um, so that's really where our strategy is going. And so partnerships like this one with the business community become, very <coughs> become a really critical part of that. Um, how do we help companies make money, improve their business performance uh, by protecting nature? because of the value it provides them and their communities and their, and their stakeholders. And in the process, get better conservation outcomes, more, um, uh, what was the word that Henry used, uh, more transferable um, uh, conservation outcomes that we could if we just go at it project by project. So that's really what this um, effort is, is all about for us strategically. I just want to say a word about what we're actually doing. We've talked a lot about why it's important, but let's talk about what we're actually doing. Um, so we made a five-year commitment together to incorporate the value of nature into Dow business decisions. Ultimately, we want that to be a company-wide approach that Dow takes, that other companies can learn from, but we wanted to anchor that in some very uh, practical experience. So <coughs> we're committed to do three pilots. Uh, we've finished the first that I'll talk about a little bit here. Um, we've embarked on the second, uh, and we're still talking about what the third will be. Um, our first pilot was at uh, Freeport, Texas, uh, Dow's largest uh, facility globally responsible for, I think, 20% of Dow's worldwide production. Um, massive uh, facility on the Gulf Coast in Texas, uh, been there since the 1930s, um, dependent on nature in a couple of critical ways. Uh, you see um, in the lower uh, right-hand corner um, an image from the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, Freeport is on the Texas Gulf Coast. It's in Hurricane Alley. It experiences um, tremendous hurricanes uh, every year, and, and as we know, hurricanes are getting uh, more intense um, uh, as time goes by. Um, so the coastal ecosystems there, the marshes, the shellfish reefs, provide a natural barrier against storms. Uh, we wanted to look at, well, what's that worth to Dow? Uh, and is that a form of natural infrastructure that Dow should be investing more in? 
Um, <coughs> moving to the upper right, uh, that's an image of the Brazos River. Uh, the Freeport facility is at the mouth of the Brazos River. Uh, as you can see, because of the tremendous droughts Texas has suffered, it's been running almost dry uh, for the last few years. Because Dow has been there since the 1930s, they have senior water rights, but that doesn't really mean much if the water doesn't make it uh, to the facility. They have two storage reservoirs, they might have to build more. Uh, so we wanted to look at what could we do upstream um, to protect and restore watersheds, to work with other water users, farmers, for example, to use their water more efficiently, to put more water back into the river. Um, and lastly, Freeport sits in a very uh, polluted area, the Houston Galveston Brazoria Air Quality District. Um, Houston's growing fast, uh, a lot of uh, ozone pollution, uh, largely from transportation, but the industrial facilities contribute to it. So every time Dow wants to expand its plant, it needs to add very expensive pollution control devices. We wanted to look at whether restoring some of the native forests in the area might take precursors of ozone, nitrogen in this case, out of the atmosphere uh, more cheaply, perhaps uh, more effectively for the community at large uh, than pollution control devices. Um, so we put a team of our scientists, led by Jed Muller, who's here tonight, um, on the ground with uh, engineers and scientists from Dow's Freeport site, and we studied each of these three <coughs> ecosystem services, tried to create some new valuation models and methods um, to see whether we could find business value. And I won't go through all of that, but one interesting uh, finding uh, that we came to is that in that, on that issue of air quality, uh, we uncovered some potentially very uh, material benefit uh, that Dow could derive from reforestation as an air quality control strategy. Um, you wouldn't be uh, properly um, treated in a Kennedy School seminar room if you didn't have a graph with some economics, so we had to throw this in. Um, but if you look on the, on the far right, that's uh, what it will cost Dow to add pollution control um, devices to uh, its plant. Um, and if you look at the, the green bars on the left, that's the uh, green infrastructure alternative. Um, so you'll see that we think reforestation could save Dow $500 or so a ton of pollution control. Um, if we can combine the, the um, nitrogen control with carbon credits from a carbon market, say from the California carbon market, um, the price goes down even lower. Um, so we think we actually have an economically attractive pollution control option that for the Nature Conservancy allows us to uh, extend uh, the restoration of native bottomland hardwood forests in the Brazos River Basin. Um, we're excited about it not only because it can help Dow and help the Brazos <coughs> River, but if this really works and we can get EPA to approve it, which we're in the process of, of doing now, uh, we think other companies uh, might similarly invest so we can scale it up in the Houston area, um, and other urban areas might want to try this as well so we can replicate it across the country or around the world. Um, I won't say much about uh, our Brazil project that's underway. We're looking at a very different kind of business. It's a greenfield site uh, where Dow uh, and a joint venture partner are creating a sugarcane to ethanol facility. Uh, and we're looking at what are the values of, of ecosystems, forests in this case, to sustainable agricultural production, and how can we help Dow optimize the mix of forests and sugarcane on the property that they're developing. Um, we're, um, we're midway through that pilot and uh, look forward to reporting more. Um, so let me just wrap up, um, sort of zeroing in on the goals. Um, the pilots really are a means to an end. Our goal here is to help Dow as a company create the, uh, the goals in the context of their sustainability goals, um, the metrics, the tools, the policies, the practices to incorporate these ecosystem values in all of their business decisions. And if we can do that, encourage companies uh, uh, in <coughs> a whole range of industries to do the same. Again, uh, getting back to the idea that we need to show how nature has value for people. Um, companies uh, and their shareholders and stakeholders in this case uh, as a way from a conservation perspective of really uh, achieving our mission um, and from an economic perspective uh, allow business to grow sustainably in an, in an economically efficient way. Um, let me just close with a word on collaboration. I'm really um, thrilled, uh, we're really thrilled to be the recipient of this award. Um, collaboration is critically important. I have to get up tomorrow at about 4 a.m. And, and fly back to Washington, D.C. We have about 100 trustees in from around the country in Washington this week, uh, and we're going to go up to Capitol Hill and have a lobby day. Um, and you might ask, why are we bothering to go to Capitol Hill and have a lobby day? Well, it turns out the members are all there and they don't have much to do. Um, <laughs> we're going to go up and talk to them about the value of nature, the importance of conservation to their districts and their constituencies, and really try to drive home this economic point. Um, and we think, you know, it's, in all seriousness, we're not. This, this partnership doesn't mean we're turning away from the need for public policy and regulation. We're, we're as engaged on that as ever. But if you're paying attention, you know it's incredibly hard to get that done in Washington right now. 
Um, so <coughs> collaborations like this, we think, are a critically important way not only to get work done in the meantime, but to show policymakers that there doesn't have to be an inherent conflict between our conservation objectives and the business community's business objectives, and that we can actually, uh, as Leslie said, frame up some pretty meaningful um, economic solutions that are also conservation solutions. So again, thanks again. Look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Okay, um, so I want to now broaden the conversation out. Uh, I, I'm going to cheat, and I get to ask the first question, but it will be a question. Um, as uh, many of us who have worked on ecosystem services and partnerships uh, have observed, <coughs> the number of failures in this area vastly exceeds the number of successes. Um, you spoke of the big push at uh, the Johannesburg Summit for partnerships. Uh, most of them blossomed and perished within a couple of years. Uh, as, uh, as we've run the competitions for the Roy Award and have reviewed uh, many, many, many of these, um, a, a disturbing set that we were considering giving awards to have since the time we fortunately didn't give them uh, collapsed in a pile of rubble. So I'm going to ask the two of you, um, in this one, this set of uh, things which actually have worked so far, what's the single thing that most caused you to wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night because you thought, if this doesn't go just right, get one more step, this whole thing's going to fall apart? What was, the, what was the scariest, hardest thing about making it work so far? Aside from every time Neil calls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess what I mean by that is, so Neil and I have been friends for a long time. We, we like each other. We love spending time together. But this is high stakes for both of our organizations. And it's easy to sit up here and talk about what we want to get done. It's a lot harder to actually get out there and do it. Um, just getting the work done, really encouraging our colleagues in the Nature Conservancy and in Dow to think about doing their work differently is incredibly challenging. So I think the basic <coughs> dynamics of collaboration between a business and an NGO um, have been incredibly hard. So we think if we can actually make the project work operationally, getting our teams to really behave differently uh, with each other, um, we'll generate some pretty important findings that can make a big difference. But it's actually doing the work that has been the, sort of the, um, the, the most challenging part of it. Yeah, Bill, you, you seem to have a furrowed brow. Yes, You're wondering yes, about yes. that. I, I think the, uh, I agree with Glenn. I, I'm not laying awake at night worried about a single thing, but there are so many moving parts. There's the need to validate so many different approaches, and this is enormously complex and challenging. We made it sound relatively easy, but the reality is it's enormously technically challenging. The economics are uh, unusual uh, because we're asking questions at more of a site scale rather than a whole river system type scale. So I, I do worry about delivering the promise, but because we worry about it, we're working hard to make sure that we do deliver, and to this point about, he was saying, getting work done, it, you know, these are two huge organizations that are accustomed to working in certain ways. You know, they're, they have work processes, they have experts, they have business units, all of that. And to get them to turn on the dime to do something completely different, it's not that easy. Well, I believe that, but yeah. what, what was the hardest thing for you to convince your own colleagues in Dow about this crazy idea of collaborating with PNC? Uh, it, it actually wasn't that difficult to, to convince, to convince, because the, everybody understood that we needed to get better and we needed a partner who understood what we were trying to do as a company. So actually, the, the selling of doing it was not as difficult as you might expect, and I was also asked to recommend. So having a CEO that is open and willing to do this kind of experiment, and not just our CEO, Mark Tursek of TNC, um, it's, there's risk to both organizations 
especially if we don't deliver. So we're very uh, concerned, but focused positively on delivering. But there's a lot of need for this work to go well mm -hmm. in other companies, in other countries, et cetera. So we're very focused on that. Well, the, uh, the point, and it's, and it's discussed in, in the, the report uh, that, that they've done of the project to date is, I mean, the, part of the point of this is to do this well, to validate it, to have these great examples, and then to widen the circle. I mean, that's the idea. That's where the, the, the impact comes by, by proving in a defensible way that this works for the econ economically, it works environmentally, and then getting other companies to try it. And you guys might want to talk a little bit to the audience about the fact that, you know, the other companies are already starting to do this and agreed to, to try to do some similar things at the, at the last uh, year, year or two ago at the, Rio, the new Rio conference um, and the Clinton uh, global initiative. There's some companies that have, you know, aligned around this. I don't know whether you've got enough material for them yet, but clearly there is growing interest in this and, and that the benefit of the partnership is not whether you guys, you know, go walk hand in hand for the next 20 years together. That's fine if you do, but whether you create a product that you can cast out on the waters and sell to, you know, as an approach to a lot of your peers. I mean, that's where, you know, that's where the, the, the real, a lot of the benefit is going to occur. And so the quality of the work you do, get validating it, as you point out, and then selling it to others uh, and getting them to try it too, you know, has the potential for a significant broader impact than just these two companies. Mm -hmm. So your cold sweat issue should be that Leslie turns out to be your auditor. <coughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> No, just, just to yep. pick up on that, so Leslie's right. There's a lot of interest in this topic now in the business community. It was a big theme at Rio. There, we were part of a Clinton Global Initiative commitment with a bunch of companies to explore this. But it's hard, and humbly, we really think we're kind of at the cutting edge of really trying to demonstrate it in a business setting at a company-wide scale. So that's why we put a lot of pressure on ourselves to actually sure, deliver the of course. work. Yeah, I would just add very briefly, we did a uh, we were writing a paper on green infrastructure in the private sector. So we, this was about six months ago, and we really went out there looking for examples. In that one narrow, not the totality of this, but that one narrow area, we could only find about five or less actual examples in the private sector. And, and what it tells me is that the activation energy of actually getting that change to happen, even if people believe there's value there, we have to demonstrate uh, clearly the value and really change the, the education around engineering, the practice, to have people at least think about it. It's, it's a pretty big challenge, but we're mainly focused on improving the decision in a narrow sort of way for us and then leveraging it out at this point. And finally, of course, thank you to our panelists for being here. Thank you.